My name is Sandy Carter, and I'm with Willamette Falls Heritage Foundation. I was also a LOX volunteer with the Corps of Engineers, so I had a key to the LOX Museum, which is down on the canal. And that was fun, because I could take tours down there. But the thing is that the Corps got comfortable with me as a volunteer, so anytime anything happened down there, I was down there taking pictures. So I took pictures at all the lock fests, and other people took pictures at lock fests, and I ended up with quite a collection of just festival pictures. And then when the gate repairs were done, the gates were all pulled off and moved out by barge onto a repair barge. I was there taking pictures. When they were brought back and hung up again, I was there taking pictures. When they exposed some of the elements where the gates are mounted into the walls, I was able to take pictures. The Willamette Falls Locks were the first significant navigational improvement west of the Rockies. What's called the Columbia Snake Basin goes from the crest of the Rockies to the ocean. It was the first significant navigational improvement uh, by the United States. The state was only 13 years old when the locks were built. They were built before the Eiffel Tower. I like to throw that in just to give people perspective. They were built by private money. It was a big political fight. There was all this competition to get them built to control the river because the river was transportation. It was the highway. The private folk that built them uh, had money, a bond loaned to them from the state that had to be uh, repaid if they couldn't open them on their deadline. Their deadline was New Year's Day, 1873. So they knew about the deadline and wanted to break this new company. If, so they went out and tied up every boat on the river so that there were no boats to rent to take people through. And you had to lock through with a load full of passengers on, the, on that day. So luckily, they went way down river to the, almost to the Columbia, I think, and they found this kind of tired old boat called the Marie Wilkins, and they engaged that boat, had it come up to the locks, and uh, that was the most important thing that that little boat ever did. But when you read the papers of the time, it was huge. The governors, the mayors, the uh, secretaries, uh, Everybody, and all the rich people that were building Portland. So Ladd and Goldsmith and a whole bunch of folks that you'd, you'd see their names in the Riverview Cemetery right now. They were all there when this was opened because this was so important. And it became a private transportation facility. Maybe in the next 20 years, the railroad came through and connected and people started moving traffic on this, this new way. But for a long time, there were just things that the only way you could move them, like logs, was the river, because the highways weren't built yet. And then in 1889, the first transmission of electricity from Oregon City to downtown Portland came across the river and, you know, went down through Lake Oswego, and the mills on the island started building up again. A big flood had washed out Lynn City. In the 60s, they built the locks when there was nothing on the island. And then after the locks had been there for about 20 years, they started rebuilding the industry. Like 1910-ish, the Corps started getting complaints about the locks were so busy and it was a bottleneck and they need to make it better or faster or something. So they started looking at the Corps of Engineers, the federal government started build, looking at building their own through uh, Oregon City. And one of the drawings here shows the two proposed routes through the industry that existed in Oregon City at that time. My theory is the industries fought back, the Chamber of Commerce screamed, and they didn't build. They bought the locks that it, by now were in West Lynn because West Lynn was established in 1913. They bought the locks in about 1915, deepened it. Um, there are a lot of classic pictures around, but I didn't use any pictures of that. They are on the digital picture frame that was loaned to us from the Dow's Dam. Yeah, there's a lot of great pictures of the, re the repairs they did when they bought them. And then there was a huge flood of the Willamette River in 1922, the winter of 22, I think. 
And so there are a whole series of pictures from 1923 on this wonderful digital picture frame, which I'd never seen, in which I actually couldn't recognize that it was at the locks. It just looked like a sandy plain because the flood had completely filled in the canal. And the Corps of Engineers had to take it out again. So anyway, in 1935, you know, super busy, t millions of tons of logs and things going down the river. And um, the railroads hadn't really killed it that bad. Um, but they did a federal legislation called the Willamette Basin Act. And it involved a lot of dredging and stuff to improve marine traffic on the river. Uh, and under that act, and at that time, I found out in the course of the last 20 years, my grandfather was uh, high up in the Corps of Army and Engineers office in Portland. And he actually was uh, sort of in charge of the locks. One of the drawings in the Lewis collection is signed by my grandfather at the engineers. So that was really fun. And he was looking at drawings in 1935 and 6, and, and the drawing is on the wall, that shows the Corps' plan to wipe out the locks as they exist today with the four tandem lifts with one 46-foot lift wider that would be so much better for river traffic. So the plans are there. It never happened. One, it would have wiped out the industry and the electricity generation. So that would have been a powerful anti-voice in the crowd. Two, World War II was on the horizon federal budget changed, the money moved away. I, I don't know how much of the Willamette Basin Act they ever actually did. They might they probably did some dredging or something, but the locks were saved by the bell. So they've remained the same. And for a long time, they were the oldest continuously operating multi-lift bypass locks in the United States. We had to do a lot of advocacy over the last 20 years. For several years, we had something we called Lock Fest, starting in the early 2000s, because it was amazing how many people didn't realize there was even a canal down there, let alone the fact that it was opened in 1873 and it was still letting traffic move around Willamette Falls. But that isn't enough. Uh, popularity doesn't necessarily bring, bring money. I've been in a series of advocacy groups that, well, I can only count them on one hand, but they were pretty good. The first one was an Oregon Solutions process, which started in about 2006. And that was, we were approved as a project for Portland State's Consensus Center, where they have pro projects that aren't controversial, but they're big, they're unusual. And, they, they have to bring in a lot of partners, and not everybody is at the table yet, so it, it's not being solved. So anyway, we got to be an Oregon Solutions uh, project under Governor Kulangowski in the early 2000s. And we worked uh, in that way. We built a big interested parties list. Darlene Hooley did a um, Willamette River United meeting at the top floor of the Historical Society Museum and people all up and down the valley came because we wanted to keep the river open and could see the advantages in the future to having being able to use this amazing transportation resource. So long story short, um, after the or first Oregon Solutions process ended, I sort of managed the advocacy for a couple years and then the county adopted it, so that was good, it went up a level. You know, I always said, what we need is somebody to manage this that has a higher skill set, and you know, higher pay grade than me. So the, the county and the county commission was involved and lots of good partners. And so they introduced uh, some legislation and the Lama Falls Locks Commission was set up uh, it was supposed to be modeled kind of on the Gorge, Gorge Commission, a group that, you know, had electeds and people who uh, were invested in this project um, 
figuratively as well as with bringing money to it, you know, uh, county councilors, so forth. So there was a LOX commission. Before that, there was a wonderful LOX uh, group led by Governor Roberts. She was, she was great. Um, the first Oregon Solutions Group was brought together by Vern Duncan, who's a very well-esteemed former legislator and superintendent of um, instruction for Oregon. So all these really good folk that had the leadership skills to bring people together led these different groups. And then the commission was led by um, the mayor, Russell Axelrod at the time, and then um, Martha Schrader, county commissioner, and I were co-chairs of that. And then we got legislation, and we did a bunch of due diligence, and we got the um, engineering studies to show what it would take to fix the locks and update them enough to be able to open them again and to pay for whatever the core thought needed being done because the core wasn't um, finding it within their budget to do all of the things that needed to be done to reopen it. They closed it in December of 2011 just for that reason, not enough money in the budget to do a mandated safety inspection. So um, year before last, uh, a bill established the Willamette Falls Locks Authority, which is a public corporation. There are only four in Oregon. It's a really strange, odd duck. A public corporation has, it's a hybrid. It has a few advantages of being in the state government, but it's not. It's a corporation uh, that doesn't necessarily have to follow all the state rules either as far as procurement and stuff, which can get really onerous for a super small startup uh, if you're actually government. So who else is a public corporation? The State Fair Board. OHSU on Pill Hill. That was one of the first ones. And I think um, Workers' Comp. So that's four of us in the state, all entirely different entities. And this one, we're just trying to make our way. We've, we've, we know what we need to do. We're trying to raise enough money for it. Hundred fiftieth anniversary of the opening is tomorrow, so somebody had to do it. Somebody had to like happy birthday, locks, let people know that they're here, and the library was good enough to let us have January because that's the anniversary month from 1873 to 2023. What we have in the community room right now is pretty eclectic poster board, because we don't have a huge budget or any place to keep a bunch of real pictures, but um, there, there's something for everyone, I hope. There are engineering drawings um, that probably people aren't aware of, uh, some of the historic points in the history of the locks. And then there's lots of pictures of all different vessels going through it at different times. And we have a great book, Shutterfly book, that I want people to look through, which shows people people that have advocated, people that have come to Lockfest, people that have volunteered along the way. So it's very, that was a really fun project. Um, there is a digital picture frame, which was loaned to us by the Corps of Army Engineers Dalles Dam Museum. It has some great, really historic internal core file photos. We were very fortunate. We have four beautiful big enlargements from the Old Oregon collection. And uh, the Old Oregon collection, uh, those four photos are sort of the stars of what I'll call the history wall, the black and white wall. And, and one of our good members on the foundation, I think he's been gone, I think he passed maybe six or seven years ago, was Alan Lewis. He was also a Willamette Falls Locks volunteer, the vest, the whole thing. And uh, when he passed, he left the foundation a really cool collection. Only one of his donated sketches is in this exhibit. Who would I like to thank? Uh, you know, to get the locks to where they are today and enable me to put the exhibit up and celebrate the 150th, um, because without the advocates, 
the Corps of Engineers was going to build a bulwark across and permanently close off the river there. And that would have been all she wrote. So I want to thank um, all the advocacy groups that have led up to this. Plus, in terms of working on this exhibit, um, of course, the foundation, uh, the Willamette Falls Locks Authority, Willamette Falls and Landings Heritage Area Coalition, which uh, now has Old Oregon's photo collection uh, included under their umbrella since John Clatt died for um, printing me four wonderful uh, photos from the collection. Um, PGE is contributing to the party. We are having an actual celebration with a program and hopefully a bunch of the folks I'm talking about right now showing up on Saturday, January 21st at two o'clock here. So hope for non-freezing weather. That's important. Um, Jerry Herman actually called and is going to have a singing group out there on the steps of the library for 15 minutes as people come into the party. So I want to thank him. He called me out of the blue. Uh, Jeff Jones did my labels for me. I gave him the story. He did that for me. Jody Carson and Russ Axelrod helped me. Um, both former city councilor, mayor, folk who are now very active on all these locks and heritage groups. Uh, it's, it's, I think, a really healthy community in town here. I don't know. Is it a cult? Is it a subculture? Um, <clears throat> and then people who, uh, also people who loaned for the, loaned their t talent or their images. Rachel Tillman uh, worked with me because she's a Shutterfly whiz. We have a great Shutterfly book I want people to be able to look at and you know, oh, that was Lockfest in 2008. That's me in the canoe, you know. And then um, the staff at the Dalles Dam on the part of the Corps of Engineers loaned the digital picture frame and loaded the Portland District uh, archival photos of the repairs and things and the floods. So too many people really to thank. But um, yeah, as I think I said, legions have been involved with this. Uh, we always had like 100 volunteers when we had Lockfest. And, you know, my mate was had a flag and parked people for several years, because that's what you do. Um, the Lions, Westland Lions, have always been a big uh, supporter. And the McLean House. And so the whole community, I think, stands behind this goal of having this resource working again. and having everybody down there to enjoy it in because everybody around here has a canoe or a kayak and likes to get out in their boat or just go down and watch the boats, which is my speed.